Good Morning. This is Faith in Our Hometown, brought to you as a community service of Mercy Hospital Joplin. And now, here's your host, Father Jay Friedel. Happy Sunday morning, everyone. Welcome back to Faith in Our Hometown. Uh, we're going to try something a little different on our show today. It's one of those things that I wanted to do when we started doing the show. And this will be our first time to do it. And so my guinea pig, I mean my guest this morning, <laughs> is uh, Aaron Brown, who's the lead pastor at St. Paul's United Methodist Church. And one of the things we're going to be talking about this morning is... Um, What's the difference between like Catholics and Methodists? I, you know, we, every, everybody has this title on their building and they go to a particular church and we really sometimes don't know that much about each other. So we're just going to wander into this this morning and talk a little bit about uh, what's a Methodist, what's a Catholic, what are some of the similarities, what are the differences, and we plan to do that a little bit with some of our other guests in weeks to come. But uh, this morning we're hoping it's going to be a fun conversation uh, where we get to talk to each other about what it means to be a Methodist or a Catholic here in the greater Joplin area. Um, we'll be right back after this Mercy Minute. Hi, I'm Angie Separito with Mercy Hospital. I am here today with Dr. Jahan Zeb, interventional cardiologist at Mercy. Is that right? That's correct. What type of patients do you generally see? Uh, we see patients with uh, heart and vascular disease with problems such as chest pain, shortness of breath, uh, irregular heart rhythms. And you do, uh, being an interventional, what type of uh, procedures do you do? Uh, interventional cardiology refers to procedures that are done uh, non-surgically uh, through a minimum invasive approach. Uh, they involve inserting catheters, which are uh, thin flexible tubes in the arteries uh, to diagnose and treat problems. Minimally invasive means less recovery time, so that's good for everybody. Correct. Very good. And you're located in the clinic tower at the new hospital, right? Correct. Any referral? No. No referral. If you want to find out more, you can call the number on your screen or visit mercy.net. Welcome back to Faith in Our Hometown. I'm Father Jay Friedel, our host for Faith in Our Hometown. My guest this morning is Aaron Brown from St. Paul's United Methodist it's Church. Good to be here. I'm glad to have you back. Uh, always enjoy our conversations Absolutely. together. Yeah, this is fun. This morning we're going to try this new thing, okay? Because I, I'm a firm believer in the fact that a lot of people don't know the differences, even between the different mm -hmm. Christian religions, right. much less the others. Yeah. And so this morning I want to talk a little bit about that. Uh, I know what it means to be Catholic. I'm guessing that since you're the lead pastor, you know what it is I, to be a Methodist. I, I, a little, yeah. All right, sure. good. All right. Uh, have you been Methodist your whole life? Um, yeah, I guess I have. Okay. Yeah. And, and I'm what we call a cradle Catholic. Okay. okay? That's our that's our term cradle. for baptized and raised. Yeah. Okay. Um, so um, one of the things, obviously, we're under the, both under the big umbrella of Christianity. Right. So we both would have a common belief in right. Jesus. Uh, and and I would say that again, for folks who don't know that, mm -hmm. um, most of our common beliefs about who he is and and what he did and what he taught, mm -hmm. most of those we're going to hold pretty, uh, pretty similarly. We're going to have different interpretations and different ways that we practice that and go about it. Mm -hmm. um, even in some ways, maybe even our different ways, some interpretations of the scriptures, not so much mm -hmm. between our branches, but yeah. with others. So just tell me from your, just launch in here and say, if you were explaining to somebody who walked in the door and said, hey, Pastor Aaron, what's a Methodist? Yeah. <laughs> what would you tell them? Well, you know, I'd almost have to begin with, uh, you know, that word Catholic, um, you know, uh, because who we are as United Methodists, that, that label or that tribe, you know, yeah. you might call it mm -hmm. that, uh, stems from the, the founding of the, of the Christian church in Jesus and the early apostles a couple thousand years ago, right? Right. And the, that, that it wasn't until the, the 1500s when uh, the Protestant Reformation happened and Martin Luther split off and then King Henry VIII uh, split off from the papacy and... And, and uh, John Calvin. And, and did that. his... Ooh, right. Yeah. But really, it was it was Henry VIII who who branched off the the Catholic Church. But prior to that, it wasn't called the Catholic Church. It was just the Church. Church, exactly. And uh, but there were those who protested some of the uh, the things that they saw in the Catholic Church. Like you know, we, we don't think that that's how Christianity should be lived out. And and so they split off for whatever reason. And Henry VIII and had I'm his own say, issues, right? And I'm going to go and I'm going to and I'm going to say, you know. Some of the things that people were objecting to were a little out of whack. Uh -huh. yeah. Okay, and yeah. you know, and uh, and I would say that most of it, we've actually kind of come to agree with some of the things that some of the reformers were trying to uh -huh. say. Yeah. We've actually cleaned up some of our act, you know, right. at that yeah. point in time. Yeah. And if I'm going to say that if the Reformation hadn't happened, 
we might not have cleaned it up yeah. so you know so fast. But go ahead. And that, so yeah, Henry, so Henry stuff. did his thing. Church of England splits off in the right. 16th century. And then it, it was a, a similar movement that happened in the in the 18th century, in the in the 1700s, where a guy by the name of John Wesley, uh, who was an Anglican priest uh, in in the Church of England, just said, "Hey, there's some things that I see that that I want to change. I want to do differently." Um, and one of the big things for him, and, and by the way, Wesley never wanted to start another denomination. It was never his idea to go start a new well, movement. Luther didn't want to either when it, it, he started. It, it, you know, it, but it's he wanted to reform what he loved, which right. was the church. Yeah. I, ideas begin to have momentum, and that's what happened with Luther. That's what happened with John Wesley. And he began to say, and part of his thing, we talked about education last uh, Sunday. Part of Wesley's thing was we, we need to educate people. Uh, that at that time in London and England, uh, there were the desperately poor who were uneducated, who were, in his view, just trapped in their poverty. Poverty, and he said, we, we have a responsibility as followers of Jesus to educate them. And one of the things that John Wesley was criticized for by a lot of religious leaders was that he would go out to the coal fields. And when the, the coal miners were coming up out of the mines, he would stand there and, and, and preach to them and offer them good news because they, they weren't allowed to attend a church anywhere, an Anglican church. If they attended an Anglican church, they were forced to stand outside and maybe listen through the windows uh, because it was such a class system and they were sure. not able to, to um, actually go into a church. So he's like, we can't do this. So instead of inviting those people into the church, he went to them and said, there's this good news, this message of good news and great joy that I want to tell you about. And again, he wasn't trying to start something new. He was just trying to, I feel these stirrings, he would yeah. say. Uh, I feel that people need to know this good news and the story, so I'm going to go to them and do yeah. it. And uh, because of that, Wesley was pushed out of a lot of churches and, and excluded from a lot of things himself. Uh, but then his movement carried to the colonies in you know in the early 1700s, right. and it was when uh, the um, Revolutionary War broke out that something had to break. And so the people that were kind of um, uh, moving the way John Wesley did could no longer be a part of the Church of England uh, when the Revolutionary War started. So that's when uh, the, it was called the Methodist Episcopal Church began in yeah. uh, 1784, in the Christmas of 1784. There you go. Well, you know, I, I, I just know that so many people are unaware of some of this history right. and what makes a Methodist unique in that regard. Probably should um, say why, why the name Methodist. Go ahead. Well, so yeah. uh, Wesley, when he was a, a student, um, was so methodical about his life. Right. I mean, this is a guy that would journal in increments of 10 minutes of every day. What, not, not every 10 minutes he wouldn't do it, but he would journal what he did every 10 minutes, what he and, thought. And record it. And yeah, record so, it. This is what I did in this section of each hour. Yeah. And, and so he's methodical about his own personal life, methodical about how he served people. And so he had a group of, of other men that were trying to be as dedicated to Christ as they possibly could right. be. So uh, they would go tutor students and they would go work with the poor and they were methodical about that, that there were these expectations. In fact, they got labeled, this group of, of young men got labeled the Holy Club. Uh, again, that's not what they wanted to be called, but they got, because they took their I don't know that everybody liked that and that as a name either. So, you know, you yeah. wouldn't like that? Yeah. Um, maybe we ought to call ourselves the Holy Club. Maybe that's a the, thing. We can, no, never mind. There we go. So mm -hmm. uh, anyway, but yes. they, they also got called in a derisive way, Methodist. You guys are so methodical about your spiritual lives, you know, and, and so it was a, a term of derision that kind of caught on. And, and in some ways, uh, probably not unlike the Roman Catholic Church, we have uh, methods of doing things. Sure. And we have a structure that, uh, that guides us, uh, sure. doesn't restrict us in, in who we are, how we live out our faith. But. Well, and I think if, if most people are honest, okay, I think if most people are honest, habits build on what works for you. If you start finding something works, you want to turn whatever that practice was into a habit. You want to make sure that you are in that mode where you're saying, okay, this worked for me, so I want to do it again, mm -hmm. or I want to do it some more. And, and, and both of our traditions do lend themselves to practices uh, that are methodical. Mm -hmm. um, you know, one of the things that, one of the big complaints about people about Catholic Mass is, well, it's always the same thing. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, and that's the yeah. point. Mm -hmm. uh, it is always the same thing. Mm -hmm. And you can go in any Catholic church in the world and you're going to get, whether it'll be in a different language or not, you're going to get the same readings, you're going to get the same structure, you're going to get the same prayers, and you're going to have the same conclusion. Now, is that, the, is that true of every Roman Catholic church? 
everywhere in the world yes uh, every roman catholic church every sunday of the year i can be in i can walk into a church in germany france italy uh -huh. you know africa and, and even though the music might be a little different, even though the language is going to be a little bit different, we're going to be using the same readings on that day, yeah. okay? And, we, and many of us use Universal Lectionary, and we can talk about that a little mm -hmm. bit more later if we want. But, you know, you're going to have the same readings in that church on that day. Uh, now, the homily is going to be different because the interpretation is going to be different. The, the homily is a, a sermon. message, yeah, a yeah, sermon. sermon yeah. Yeah. Homily technically is a sermon based on the readings and especially the gospel. But yeah, so we, mm -hmm. you know, we, we have a tendency to give homilies more than sermons, mm -hmm. okay? Because we usually. Well, how do you define a sermon? Well, a sermon could be on, you know, I'm going to preach this week about being a good guy, oh, okay? Okay. But it might not be. But see, again, that's that's one of those things again different for us is we get handed the readings and told, okay, you're going to preach on this this week, yeah. rather than uh, mm -hmm. some of our other neighbors who, for example, say this week I'm going to talk about this, and now I'm going to find my scripture reading to to do that, right. you know, and what whatever I want to do to support that. Um, so, within that context, what we do is we, we're handed the readings and we said, okay, this is what you need to figure out mm -hmm. Jesus is saying to you this week. And here's your gospel and figure that out, okay? So that's how we go about it rather mm -hmm. than saying, okay, what I'm going to preach about. So, right. um, and I could preach about something else, I mean, mm -hmm. you know, if I really wanted to, but place of preference is always given to the gospel, yeah. okay, and then the other scripture readings that support it, right. um, and every week, uh, that's how we go about it. So when I go, if I, again, if I'm in a different country, whatever, I know it's going to be those mm -hmm. readings. You're even more methodical than Methodists are, well, sounds like. Some, uh, you know, Catholics, being Catholic is, um, it's a trip, mm -hmm. okay, <laughs> uh, because when you really realize that, that when we do it universally, I mean, we really are thinking universal in that way, that this is one of those ways that we do it around the world. Um, we do it everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, and it kind of caught on in all of our practices. Yeah. Uh, so when we think it's a good idea for everybody, we say, okay, this is what we're going to do. Yeah. Okay? This is what we're going to do. And um, I, I always laugh because, you know, sometimes dealing with my... Um, uh, you know, other friends, you know, especially doing campus ministry all these years, <laughs> work closely with a lot of different ministers of a lot of different denominations. And we'd go do our shtick and, and everybody would say, okay, Father Jay, what's the Catholic position on this? And it's very easy for me to usually mm -hmm. give the Catholic position yeah. on something because we'll figure it all out together and then we'll spit it on out there. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it is the official position. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the bishops usually are the ones who give the position, uh, uh, you know, and the Pope is the leader of all the bishops in the world. Mm -hmm. They give the position, and then we all kind of like figure, okay, how are we going to make all this work? Yeah. Whereas when somebody would ask, for example, a Baptist, you know, what's the Baptist position? Well, you know, my friend Andy Pratt uh, would always say, there's no such thing as the Baptist position. It's yeah. this Baptist's position. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, Catholics always look like... Um, well, that's an important distinction oh, that, yeah. that uh, uh, non-denominational churches, where there isn't that wider connection of, hey, we're going to do all do it this way and have these common beliefs and these understandings, uh, as opposed to a denomination like the United Methodist Church or the Roman yeah. Catholic Church. Well, that's why I was laughed, though, because, I mean, if you really think there's uniform agreement on everything in the Catholic Church, you're, it's right. a pipe dream, yeah. okay? But we do have official positions, and the bishops are the official teachers, so it's always easy to figure to go back to that and to figure out what they're saying. So within that context, um, I always laugh because, you know, uh, we've got the Catholic position, but, it, but there's, you're never going to find the second Catholic church of whatever. Mm -hmm. We'll have a different Catholic church, but it's all they're all together. Like this first so Methodist not, this and second, second Methodist. Methodist exactly. And well, you're not going to find that in the Catholic church. Yeah. Now, the only difference is, is that we're going to stick together. We're going to beat, just keep beating each other up. <laughs> um, not that we're going to agree anymore. So... There you have it. Uh, that's one of those little flavors of Catholic. Um, we're going to be right back in just a second. This is Faith in Our Hometown. You're watching Faith in Our Hometown on KSN TV, brought to you as a community service of Mercy Hospital Joplin. One of the notes from one of our producers on the break was, did I need to define what a reading was? Mm -hmm. Well, for us, those are scripture readings. Uh, in the Catholic tradition, every week we have a reading from the Hebrew scriptures. Uh, you know, then we have a, a psalm response to that. Okay, mm -hmm. so there's one, two pieces of scripture. The third piece then is, uh, you know, uh, usually one of Paul's letters. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then we have a gospel reading. Matthew, so we Mark, all Luke, that. or John. Yep, exactly, those four. Um, uh, uh, and so with those four readings, um, you know, I always chuckle when people say Catholics aren't very biblical and I'm like, but what the heck? Um, and again, I, you know, we just, it, 
Our, mm -hmm. our way of doing it may be differently. Mm -hmm. Like for example, we don't necessarily encourage everybody, we encourage everybody to read the scriptures. Mm -hmm. but we don't necessarily encourage everybody to bring their Bible to church and read it along mm -hmm. with. Mm -hmm. um, I, I caught all kinds of grief at St. Peter's when I got there and we ordered hymnals and the readings weren't in the hymnals. And everybody says, well why? And I said, well because for us, traditionally, the scriptures are to be proclaimed, mm -hmm. not just everybody sitting together and reading them, mm -hmm. okay? Because again, it's that group think. Catholics mm -hmm. are always the group think, okay? So, you know, we're like the herd mentality mm -hmm. of Christianity, all right? <laughs> and again, it's not like there's not, uh, you know, communal dimensions to be in Methodist, because mm -hmm. you guys certainly have communal dimensions mm -hmm. as well. But we're just kind of like that to the mm -hmm. nth degree because, mm -hmm. You know, we're just kind of, that's the way we do it. Yeah. Um, so how do you guys, so we've got this, you know, uh, we got bishops, you guys have got bishops, we got bishops, but you guys also have a different way of coming up with polity and, right, you know, positions yeah. and all that kind of good <laughs> stuff. Why don't you share some of that? Because I, I find this fascinating about Methodists because yeah. it's very American. Yeah. Well, you know, it's it, very American in the <laughs> sense of the way, even though you got a bishop, everybody gets together and haggles it out. Right. Well, the our belief about different things is set by what's called the General Conference. Mm -hmm. And so uh, that is a, a worldwide conference that's uh, almost always held here in the United States, um, but it happens every four years, and there are delegates from, like Missouri is its own conference, mm -hmm. and so we send a number of delegates to the general conference, and at the general conference, they'll they'll debate the, the church's stance on different things, social justice issues, um, practical issues, issues on economics, uh, we'll talk about all that, there'll be proposals, the proposals will be voted on, and that's what our stance will be on those things. Yeah. So now, we're concerned, only the bishops usually get together and then vote. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, ours and is, then they work together. Is, is pa their delegates are pastors and uh, people who are non-pastors, uh, laity from right. different churches in the area. So I'm not sure how many representatives we'll send to that general conference. It actually happens this spring, but I, I think there'll be about maybe 30 folks from Missouri that will go and be mm -hmm. represented there. And somehow you, so you got to pick your 30 from the whole it's, state. It's all, all the democratic. The state yep. of Missouri. It's all de the democratic. People are elected and voted on and nominated. All just. You know, it is very democratic. Sometimes our bishops always remind us that the, that the Catholic Church is not a democracy. <laughs> so I always chuckle. Um, but I will tell you that, again, like anything else, even though we don't vote on stuff, Mm -hmm. Our bishops, at least the smarter bishops, yeah. listen to the advice of their people, mm -hmm. uh, and they don't try to make decisions or things like that in a vacuum. Right. Yeah. Uh, they try That's to good consult leadership the experts. In general. Yeah. yeah. But um, but when the, when push comes to shove, it's not like we're making decisions. Mm -hmm. It's like the bishops are saying, "Okay, here's the decision." Yeah. And that that is a little bit of a difference there. Yeah. Well, one difference obviously would be that priests can't marry. Right. Pastors can marry. Right. Yeah. So where does um, that come from? Well, you know, uh, basically, I mean, in the early days of the church, actually, you know, um, when we were just one church, mm -hmm. and at the very beginning, Peter, the apostles, some of those guys, they were, they were married. You know, there were marriages among them. So it's not like marriage is evil or anything. Mm -hmm. But over the course of time, um, it, you know, people began to look at the example of Jesus. There was no evidence, at least that we can ever find, that Jesus was married, even mm -hmm. though some people make that case. Um, but we can't find any evidence that Jesus was married. And we found out over the course of time that some of the, you know, and again, reading some of the things of Paul, uh, you know, that were, that might have been taken a little bit more literally at the mm -hmm. beginning, you know, don't marry. Mm -hmm. Okay. That, of course, yep. you know, some people will argue that that was because they expected that he was coming back right away. And other people thought it was a perpetual thing. It's just said, well, if you really want to serve and, and you know, and have, and have is, full is that where it really comes from? Is the, the writings of Paul? So, some, yeah, some, no, it's, I mean, it's, trust me, this is a multifaceted thing. Okay. And I'm taking a big history and kind of like, chopping it down mm -hmm. to its its real, you know, some of its roots, okay? But but ultimately, uh, there was no formal uh, mm -hmm. statement against not marrying um, until, um, you know, probably uh, different, different places in the world were doing different things. And so again, when finally all the bishops in the world got together and said, how are we going to do this? A lot of it came down to, if somebody gave something to the church, did that belong to the priest? And if the priest were married, then it didn't belong to his children? Or did it belong to the church? Huh. And so there were all kinds of practical property considerations. Law. Oh, you, yeah, huh. property law. And one of the other things that really is true about this, and I'm, and, and again, so take it within the spirit that we that we did it. 
sometimes people just said we want our priests to do nothing but be serving mm -hmm. us. Yeah. The, the, we the don't want just, you to have. We don't want you to be splitting your time yeah. with a wife and kids and all that kind of good stuff. I, is a we want your attention to the church. In effect, that's the way it. That's the way it is, comes down. Is that down. language that's used? The uh, I use it. Um, uh, the, theologically, we don't necessarily okay. use it, but I always laugh when people say, "Well, you're not married," and I'm just like, "Oh." Oh, really? I'm married to all of you, and that's a really <laughs> scary thought, okay? Uh, because I am married in a, in a yeah. very real way, yeah. and that's what celibacy for us is. Celibacy mm -hmm. is being the state of being unmarried. Um, in the Catholic tradition, celibacy becomes one of those things that we accept uh, because it then frees us up to love generally mm -hmm. rather than specifically. Yeah. Uh, and so instead of my you know, some of my time, and you, you know, how's your wife gonna respond if you don't give her enough right. time? The, the, She's gonna have you by the ear mm -hmm. and say, uh, excuse me, you know, yeah. you committed to me and yeah. this is marriage matters, and you know. Um, and I think that's a, the different view in our churches of, of leadership too, and what is expected of me as a leader versus what's expected of you as a leader. I mean, there are clear yeah. different expectations. Because I'm not married to my church. Right, right. Yeah. And again, like I say, theologically, neither necessarily yeah. are we. But it comes down to that practically. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, we don't, we don't have a commitment ceremony in terms of the same thing that, okay. that the theology of marriage does. But in terms of uh, our, our vow of celibacy, mm -hmm. what we do take in that promise that we make to the bishop um, uh, when we're ordained is, is that are you willing to do this for the sake of the kingdom? Mm -hmm. Okay, so you're willing to do this for the greater good. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's how we embrace it. Um, mm -hmm. And it can be very freeing. Mm -hmm. I've had, you know, friends, you know, who sit there and say, gosh, there are days when I wish I was not married because I'd have freedom, <laughs> freedom to do some of these things. Now, they never mm -hmm. want to, it's not they're saying that they don't love right. their wives, I, they don't want to do that, yeah. but they look at it and they say, sometimes it looks like your way might be easier. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes I look at mm -hmm. my, you know, mm -hmm. my friends who are married that are ministers in other traditions, mm -hmm. and I look at them and I say, and there are days when I really see how that could add to my preaching, mm -hmm. how it could make me more compassionate. There are a lot of great sermon illustrations I mean, you know, oh in my your gosh, wife and yes. kids. Yeah. And of course, I spent enough time around married people. One of the best things that I always say to my married friends is, when I spend time with my friends who are married, that's when I really want to be married, mm -hmm. you know? Because I see the goodness mm -hmm. in marriage, and I see the goodness in their lives, and I see what they're able to accomplish in that mm -hmm. partnership. Right. But by the very same token, that's one part of the mystery of God's love. And celibacy stands alongside of it. The single life, too, mm -hmm. you know, stands alongside of celibacy as, uh, as alongside of marriage as a different sign of God's love. Mm -hmm. um, that's not particular. That is universal. Um, and and it also says celibacy gives some witness to the fact that there's there's more to life than flesh and bone and blood. Yeah. Uh, there's there's more in the life to come. Mm -hmm. And part of the witness of this life is supposed to be some witness that there is something that we're hanging out for that's going to be even greater than what we've got now. Mm -hmm. And those are just two parts of the same mystery. One isn't better than the other, mm -hmm. one isn't worse than the other, but they're different calls. Mm -hmm. Now, some people will rightfully argue, uh, should that be required of us? <laughs> well, it's a moot point. It is required of us. If we're going to be priests in the mm -hmm. Roman Catholic Church, it's required of us. And we've got to ask ourselves, can I give myself over to this freely mm -hmm. and fully and will it bring me joy mm -hmm. um, ultimately in life? And if you don't have a lot of experience at, at, at the joy that it's going to bring you, then you, you're crazy yeah. if you get into it and you say yes. You know, so. Now, in the Eastern Rite of the Church, uh, Eastern Orthodox, mm -hmm. they can marry. Yeah. Our deacons, our permanent deacons, as long as they're married before uh, they're ordained mm -hmm. deacons, they're allowed to be married. Um, uh, deacon Norm Ritter, uh, who's our you know, interim mm -hmm. school, he's a, he's a deacon in the church. Okay. So he's married, lovely wife, and they've got a great marriage, great grandparents, and all that good, good stuff. But Norm also felt the calling to service in the church mm -hmm. uh, while he was still a school administrator. Mm -hmm. And so he was ordained and has been serving the church you know, here in oh. Southern Missouri for several years. It's a good deal. Uh, he's a great witness mm -hmm. in that regard. Um, but if his wife dies, he's going to not be allowed to remarry in our tradition. Mm -hmm. Uh, he'll then remain celibate then for the rest of his life mm. uh, within that context. But that's just one of those little uh, 
you know, quirks mm -hmm. about that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, practice. What does your worship look like? Real fast. We're going to run out of time. We oh, got yeah. all the stuff we were worrying uh, about filling the ours time. Ours is, uh, uh, yeah, I'd probably describe it as uh, casual but reverent. Okay. Um, so, you know, we do not follow a common lectionary. Okay. Um, a lot of Methodist churches do, and that is that uh, prescribed set of scriptures. That, right. Uh, what uh, I was talking about earlier. Uh, that, yeah. that move through a, a Christian year and a cycle of, of three years. Um, so we, we do not uh, use now the common You can make that lecture. choice by church? Yes. Okay. Yeah, we, All right. We can. And uh, so for us, our worship services are, are uh, you know, probably considered contemporary by some. We have, mm -hmm. a, a, you know, a... Uh, a band that, that plays at all of our services, and um, there's a time of, of prayer, a time uh, of a message. You know, sir, I, I don't call them sermons anymore; just call them a, a message. Sure. But the, all that for for us, and again, this is different uh, for every church. But we base that on on scripture. It is all around, you know, what might God's word and how might God speak to us and and uh, inform Great. our lives. Well, I do not have time at all to get into how our worship looks in the Catholic Mass, mm -hmm. but I'm here every week, so I, I really appreciate you sharing some of this stuff. Uh, I, I just think it's, it's scratching the surface, I know, yeah. but I think it's really, I hope it's interesting for our listeners uh, as we kind of get to that, that idea of what makes a Catholic different than a Methodist. Uh, I'll be right back after this Mercy Minute. Hi, I'm Angie Separita with Mercy Hospital. I'm here today with Dr. Lance Borup. Dr. Borup, you are a breast imaging radiologist, correct? Correct. And we're going to talk about 3D mammography. Can you tell me about that? Yeah, 3D mammography is a new technology that was just uh, passed by the FDA in 2014. And what it does over 2D is it allows us to see the breast tissue in slices as opposed to overlapping tissue. And that allows us to see the breast cancers sooner and smaller, which is a better result surgically for the patient. Also, it allows us to call back patients at a, at a lower rate as well. We're finding we're only calling back about a third less of the patients than before. So quicker results and you can get them in and see things a lot clearer. So it seems like a no-brainer. That's what you want to do. Absolutely. Perfect. If you want to find out more, you can call the number on your screen or visit mercy.net. Well, this has been our week here at Faith in Our Hometown. I've been talking with Aaron Brown about uh, the differences between being a Catholic and being a Methodist, and, and Aaron, I just know that we've only scratched the surface, yeah. Yeah. but it was a delightful conversation. I hope that you all enjoyed it this morning. We hope to do that with other uh, religious leaders from other denominations, and not just Christians, but also some of our non-Catholic and non-Christian friends uh, in the area. Um, I, I do think we can benefit from, from hearing how other people approach their Christian faith, which is what we were talking about this morning, and just some of the different expressions of the way that Christianity is. It's a, it's a wide mosaic. I'm a firm believer in the fact that probably Jesus wouldn't be happy that we've chopped it into all these different pieces, but we have, and, and now it's what we live with. Uh, and uh, I think it's really good for us to be able to, with each other, be able to share faith in a way that it makes sense. There are lots of different ways to live faith. There are lots of different ways to be Christian, obviously. And friends, this is Faith in Our Hometown. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next week. Thanks for watching. Faith in Our Hometown can be seen every Sunday morning at 9 a.m. here on KSN. Brought to you as a community service by Mercy Hospital Joplin.